Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So we are thrilled to have Ankur Moitra here. He, um, many of us know him. He was an intern with us a few times. And he will be speaking about provable bounds in machine learning. <coughs> All right, great. Thanks. It's uh, great to be back. So I know many familiar faces in the audience, but maybe you haven't seen me in a suit. So this is me in a suit. Nice tie. Hi. <laughs> and today I'll be talking about provable bounds in machine learning. So the focus of this talk will be on revisiting problems in machine learning from the perspective of theory. And I'm going to try and actually talk and not just mime the title, as I hear Adam did. So let me start off with an example. This is a problem that's near and dear to the hearts of machine learning researchers called topic modeling. And for now, I'll define this informally. So suppose we're given a large collection of documents, say all the articles written in the New York Times in one calendar year. We'd like to somehow make sense of this collection. We'd like to automatically organize them based on what they're about. Now, we may want to do this for a variety of reasons, maybe to help a user browse the collection, to be able to suggest articles that he might be interested in reading based on what he's read so far. Or maybe we want to do this for purely scholarly reasons to better understand what happened in the given year. In any case, what we're now faced with is a problem in unsupervised learning. So none of these articles are labeled with what topic best describes them. Instead, all we're given access to is a massive amount of data, and we'd like to find some hidden structure in this data. And I want to emphasize that actually this is just one example of a much broader challenge in machine learning, where the goal is to develop tools for the automatic comprehension of data. This is really a holy grail in machine learning. And the algorithms and ideas that I'm going to present in this talk, even though I'll keep coming back to this example, they'll have applications not just to newspaper articles, but also to other data types, things like web pages, images, genetic sequences, and even, say, user ratings. So let me tell you something about the prevailing approach for this problem. So the standard approach, this was initiated by Sultan many decades ago, is to organize all of this data into a very large, very sparse matrix. And this matrix is called the word by document matrix. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a matrix where each row corresponds to a different word that occurs in the collection. And each column represents a different document. And then the entry in row i column j is just the frequency of occurrence of word i in document j. And actually, throughout this talk, it'll be much simpler to think about this entry as being a relative frequency of occurrence. So I'm going to normalize this matrix so that the columns sum to 1. Or equivalently, I'm thinking about the documents as being distributions on words. So this is the matrix we have in hand. It's a very large, very sparse, non-negative matrix. And there are, in fact, two different schools of thoughts for how to perform things like topic modeling. One will be based on an optimization framework. Another will be based on sort of probabilistic methods and Bayesian perspectives. I'm going to talk about both in this talk, but I'm going to start with the optimization one. So in fact, uh, a standard approach in machine learning is what's called non-negative matrix factorization. And I'm going to spend some time with this definition, and then I'm going to interpret it, because I don't think the interpretation makes sense without really thinking about it. But now we have this entry-wise non-negative matrix M. We'd like to write it as the product of two other entry-wise non-negative matrices A and W. And moreover, we'd like to try and minimize the inner dimension, so the number of columns in A or equivalently the number of rows in W. So now just to put this definition in context, what happens if we remove these non-negativity restrictions? Then we have a classic definition in linear algebra because the smallest inner dimension we can obtain is just the rank. But really, the problem changes drastically when you require these matrices to be non-negative. And the smallest inner dimension you can obtain is then called the non-negative rank. So the rank and the non-negative rank can and do behave very differently on matrices. But maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me now start with an interpretation of what this is. So why is it natural to require these matrices to be entry-wise non-negative? And the very quick answer is because we can now interpret this factorization probabilistically. 
So recall, each document is a distribution on words. And it turns out that actually in this factorization, we can always assume that the columns of A and the columns of W also sum to 1. So what this means is the columns of A sum to 1, so there are distributions on words. So we think about these intuitively as being topics. Things like, you know, a topic might be something like personal finance, where when I'm writing an article about personal finance, there are some words that I'm more likely to use, uh, things like stock and trade and broker. And each topic we're thinking of as being associated with a distribution on words. So we're hoping that when we find these non-negative matrices, the columns of this first matrix encode interesting topics that have some sort of intuitive meaning for us. And now similarly, these columns in W are distributions on a much smaller set. They're distributions on the topics. So what they actually are, this matrix encodes a representation of each document as a convex combination of topics. Or to be totally formal about this, since this is really crucial for the talk, think about this column in the matrix N. This is a document. It's a distribution on words. And moreover, we can represent this distribution equivalently as the product of this column times this matrix. So it means that this document is this convex combination of these topics. And this is precisely what makes non-negative matrix factorization so interesting throughout machine learning, is that here in this example, what it's trying to do is it's trying to take a very large number of observed variables, these documents, and express them much more concisely by finding a small number of hidden topics that explain everything, that explain all of the documents at once. Yep. The, the, the difference between this and clustering is that A, in clustering A would be 0 or 1. Exactly. And here it could be a different yep. Is this supposed to be exact, this equality? Uh, it can be approximate as well. So there'll be approximate versions of NMF, and there'll be exact ones as well. So I'll focus, I mean, uh, you know, I, I don't want to get into sort of um, the error bounds of the algorithm, so I'll focus on the exact one, but our guarantees also hold for approximate ones as well. In real life, you never would, you wouldn't get, get a small r, would you? No. If you but, insisted on an exact Right, right. But what you want, though, is you would ideally want the smallest r. And, you know, I mean, so you'd want, once you fix r, to find the most accurate one. But for starters, you'd have to be able to tell whether it's exactly r or not, right? So that's why I'm going to focus for now on this exact problem. Are there any other questions about this definition? So now, actually, let me tell you something about. So uh -huh. let me see. So in general, your learning problem would be to fix R and then do some things, minimize the L2 norm of the difference of A and or of M or what? How do yep. you optimize? Yep. In fact, there are many norms that make sense. For example, I could choose something like the Frobenius norm or the spectral norm or any of those things. But actually, I'm going to get to this in a in a in a slide, so let me defer that point slightly. But first, I want to tell you about this problem. This is actually a problem that has applications throughout machine learning, even throughout theory and beyond. So let me give you an abridged history of this problem. So in fact, um, some of the most famous applications of this problem are in machine learning and in statistics. So this problem was introduced by Lee and Song, and really the pattern in which it's applied is the same way that I just described. The idea is always to use this optimization problem to somehow extract some latent structure in your data, to express a large number of observed variables using a much smaller number of hidden variables. And actually, in this way, it has applications not just to things like text classification and information retrieval, but the same two-level probabilistic model is also used in things like collaborative filtering, in describing users' preferences as being a distribution over interest they have, which in turn is a distribution on items they might buy or movies they might watch. Actually, interestingly enough, this problem has been introduced at least three times. So the second time, which was actually before this, was by Yanakakis. And in fact, non-negative rank plays a crucial role in a number of combinatorial problems, or problems in theoretical computer science as well. So actually, Yanakakis introduced this notion of non-negative rank in the context of proving lower bounds against linear programs. So if you're given some polytope P with many facets, you'd like to know, is there another polytope Q with many fewer facets that projects exactly to P? And it turns out that the smallest number of facets you can get is the non-negative rank of some appropriately defined matrix. So this is, in fact, the direction and a connection that's been very popular recently. Uh, I've actually done some work on this with Mark Braverman on showing lower bounds for the clique polytope, which I won't get into in this talk. In fact, it even has applications like to things like the log rank conjecture, which is 
this famous central conjecture in communication complexity, which can be thought of equivalently in this language as what's the relationship between the rank and the non-negative rank for Boolean matrices. It's equivalent in this framework. So is this rank well defined? So in other words, given any matrix, can I always factor it like that? Given any non-negative matrix, you always can, because I could take entry-wise non-negative. Because for my first matrix, I could just take the matrix. Oh, the matrix is, I thought it's positive in the, in the operator sense. It's no, positive. no, no, it's entry-wise non-negative. Oh, I see. Entry-wise non-negative. From uh, the probability of finding a certain uh, word. I got that. So, right. so okay. entry-wise. Yeah, in fact, there are sort of many different. There, yeah, and there's sort of many different views of this. So you can see it directly that it's always well defined, or it'll turn out that there'll be sort of more polytope versions of what's actually going on. That'll play a role in some of the algorithms I'll describe. So this should hopefully become even clearer. Positivity in the matrix sense would not have been enough to ensure this, right? Um, strict po entry wise positivity, or are yeah. you talking about operator norm? Operator would not have been enough, but that's not what you have. So. Well, that's not what I have, but I think it would be. It would have been enough. If you have a product of two non-negative matrices, it has to be non-negative entry-wise. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. so it cannot be enough to be. I, I think uh, she's using the operator norm definition. I mean, the yeah. But it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's but it, it's, it's not uh, so crucial. Yeah. Actually, yeah. interestingly, entry-wise is easy. Interestingly enough, historically, the first introduction of this was in the 70s, was in something called uh, physical modeling where it was called self-modeling curve resolution. Uh, where the intuition for some of these applications in physical modeling is in some case you have a system which you observe some properties and you know for a priori reasons that the interaction of the components is additive. So when you're trying to explain data without using cancellation, again, you get back to non-negative matrix factorization. So in this way, it has applications to things like chemometrics, environmetrics, and even modeling things like marriage dynamics in, in economics. So this is my abridged history of the problem, and hopefully I convinced you that it's something that you know, connects many different areas. But maybe before we, should, we get too excited, maybe we should ask some basic uh, theoretical questions about this. So can we actually compute this? So what can we say about algorithms for computing this factorization? So in fact, as I mentioned, NMF is something that's used in many applications in machine learning. So you know, what do practitioners do when they're given a particular non-negative matrix? And like, they'd like to write it as the product of two other non-negative matrices. Well, in fact, what they do is, you know, it's, it's uh, I mean, a good example for it is local search. It's oftentimes heuristics without provable guarantees. So I'll describe this informally because many of you have probably seen this in other contexts, is we're faced with a non-convex optimization problem. And the idea is if we knew one of the matrices, it would be convex. So the idea behind local search is you guess A, you compute the best W, and you treat W as fixed, and you compute the best A, and you alternate back and forth. So, you know, this is an approach that has applications also to things like, you know, local search is used for things like k-means clustering and mixtures of Gaussians. But here, like in all of those other applications, it, it's just a heuristic. It fails on worst case inputs, and it really does get stuck in local optimum. In fact, even worse, there are more serious practical issues with this, namely, it's highly sensitive to things like the cost function, as we described. Do I want to measure how close A times W is to M using the Frobenius or the spectral norm? These change the output of this local search procedure. That's very undesirable because these details that shouldn't change things change the topics that you find. So do things like? Given an A and an M, it's easy to compute the W. That would be non-negative? Yeah. Which is nearest to norm, etc. Yeah, yeah, and non-negative as well. And so you can do this via like convex optimization, or you know, and the gradient descent is a sort of good way to do this as well. Are, are there any iterative algorithms that sort of start from the actual, like, uh, from the actual like rank decomposition, and then try to kind of make the vector slightly? <clears throat> well, that's a little bit tricky because you know, if you start with a matrix which the non-negative rank is very different than the rank. Then starting from the rank factorization is sort of starting from something not on the right track, so to speak. So the fact that there are matrices which these things can be very different is not only crucial in some of these combinatorial applications, but also is sort of a barrier to starting with the rank factorization in the first place. So my goal in the first part of this talk is to give you a relatively complete picture of the, the complexity of this. 
So I'm going to start with maybe the most optimistic question we should ask. The most optimistic thing we can, yep. Can you contrast the situation with the regular matrix factorization? The computational question of. So there it's solved, right? So for example, SVD will, you know, find factors which are, you know, so that's when you drop this non-negativity restriction. So the question there is just how fast can those algorithms work? But actually the point, well, so the. Polynomial versus not polynomial. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, the other thing is that, so non-negative, what makes it interesting is the fact that it, you know, in many applications, it produces better results. So the fact that in SVD, the topics you find are orthogonal is, you know, very unnatural. So these topics are difficult to interpret. But when you find topics that are entrywise non-negative, I can interpret it as a probability distribution. So, I mean, so the, when you drop non-negativity, it's entirely solved. The question is, you know, what happens now with this slight twist? So you say it's highly sensitive so to the cost function. Do you know that the exact solution is not highly sensitive to the cost function? No, the exact solution could be highly sensitive, but for sure it won't depend on things like the update procedure. Anyways, I'm not going to come back to local search. My, I mean, this is not even a simple algorithm, if you think about it, because it really depends on like the structure of local optima. So even though it's simple to implement, understanding it is you know, beyond that. Instead, I'm going to present other simple algorithms. But first, actually, I want to start with this uh, you know, uh, even more optimistic question. Maybe we can hope for an algorithm that works on all inputs. So first, let's understand the worst case complexity of NMF. And actually, I only have one slide on this, because this will not be the focus of the talk. But I want to give this a sort of, it gives a complete picture of what often happens in learning. That the optimization problems that we abstract away from these learning applications Unfortunately, they're hard in the worst case. This happens time and time again. Maybe the first few times it happened, we'd be surprised. But by now, it's almost not surprising that the theory would predict that these things are very hard. So Vivesas indeed showed that it's NP-hard to compute NMF. And on the algorithmic side, Cohn and Rothblum gave an algorithm which ran in exponential time based on, uh, based on quantifier elimination and things like this. But I want to emphasize that even here, this is not the end of the story. We should actually see, notice that this Cohn and Rothblum algorithm, it actually is exponential even for small values of R. So it's still running in time exponential on the size of the matrix. And yet the first cut of you know, what instances are interesting of NMF, you know, the most interesting instances are when the non-negative rank is small. That's when you really can take a large matrix and express it as a small number of hidden topics. So even here, we should ask a more nuanced question, namely, what's the complexity of NMF as a function of the number of topics I'm looking for? So what's NMF as a function of R? And in fact, in joint work with Sanjeev Rora, Rangji, and Ravi Kanan, we showed a nearly optimal algorithm for this. So we showed an algorithm which runs in time n times m to be R squared. And on the hardness side, any algorithm that runs in time n times m to the little o of R would violate the exponential time hypothesis, would yield sub-exponential time algorithms for three sets. So if you believe ETH, this is roughly the worst case complexity of this problem. And actually, for small values of R, this is an exponential improvement over the previous algorithm. And I want to mention that actually here, this question has some beautiful connections to algebraic problems, that it turns out that these algorithms and hardness are better understood in the language of systems of polynomial inequalities. Because instead of, I can recast this optimization problem as asking for a solution to a system of polynomial inequalities. I can treat the entries in the matrices A and W as being variables. And then the constraints that these be non-negative are linear constraints. The constraints that A times W equals M is a set of quadratic constraints. And we could ask, can we solve the system of polynomial inequalities to find the factorization? And it turns out that the running time of these solvers always depends exponentially on the number of variables. So what we get as an algebraic question out of this is, is there a way, this, uh, this is exactly why the algorithm Cohen and Rothblum runs in this time. We get an algebraic question about whether there's a way to express this optimization problem using fewer variables. So is there a way to get the number of variables we need from being a function of n and m to only a function of r? And actually it turns out that you can and actually, R squared is the right answer for this algebraic question. And that's what yields this algorithm. So, and do these things work for approximation, for what Butler's question of you know, when the matrix isn't exactly? 
Uh, these work for some notion of approximation, but it has to be pretty close to a true factorization. So it has to be you know, within some sort of epsilon. Ideally, what you'd like, so we have some other algorithms which work even in the approximation setting. The problem then is that they'll lose something in uh, how close they are. So if there is something that's epsilon close, they'll find something like r to the 1 fourth times epsilon. But regardless, this type of hardness result is also a barrier to, to you know, doing the approximate version. You better be able to solve the exact one. So I'm not going to go into what our approximate ones are, but they're based on things like uh, SDPs and uh, SVDs as well. But now, so this is a relatively complete answer to this question. But instead, what I'm going to focus on in this talk is now, so this is the worst case complexity. What I now want to focus on, though, is what if we're not willing to settle for these types of algorithms? So we're going to have to move beyond worst case analysis somehow. And really, the burning question in a lot of these learning applications is what makes these instances that we really want to solve easier? And so the focus of this talk will be on a natural condition, which I believe is the right notion in the context of text analysis, where in fact we can give a simple algorithm that provably works, and it works quickly. It works in roughly quadratic time. In fact, it works so fast that we'll be able to use this algorithm for a number of machine learning applications and be able to get even highly practical results, which get as good quality as existing best algorithms out there and are much faster. So that's informally what the focus of this talk is. So let me tell you about this condition on non-negative matrix factorization, which I think is the right notion in the context of text analysis. In fact, this condition, which is called separability, was even introduced in the machine learning community a decade before us. So it's already something that's been identified as being something that's natural. And indeed, we'll show algorithms under this condition. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to tell you about this condition. And there's a related notion called anchor words. So let me define this now. So let's take our topic matrix A. So each column in this matrix represents a different topic. And each row represents a different word. And now throughout this talk, I'm going to use colored squares to denote uh, non-zero entries and white squares to denote zeroed entries. So all I'm going to be interested in is the zero non-zero pattern of these topic matrices. Now, let me define an anchor word informally. An anchor word is a word that when it occurs, you know what topic generated it. So let me give you an example. So take a topic like personal finance. As I mentioned, there are words that you're likely to use when you're writing an article about personal finance. You know, things like stock and trade. Yet these are words that are shared with other topics because they can and do get used in other contexts. But if you think about a word like 401k, then this is a word that's fairly unique to this topic. It's a very good indicator because it's a technical word. Or to put it combinatorially, 401k is an anchor word for the topic personal finance because the only non-zero entry in this row occurs in the column corresponding to personal finance. So this is the definition of an anchor word. Let's see another example. What about a topic like baseball? Again, you have words like home run and pitcher that can and do get used in other contexts. You know, home run is frequently used in business to say good job. Yet if you have a word like bunt, then this is a very technical word that's specific not just to sports but to baseball. So this would be a good anchor word. Or something like Oscar winning. This is great for movie reviews. So this is the notion of an anchor word. And now the notion of separability is just that every topic has an anchor word. Or combinatorially, for all columns, there's a row where the only non-zero entry is in this column. And I want to emphasize that I'm not going to assume that we know the anchor words. We don't know them. But just the fact that they exist, when our algorithm finds them, it'll be like a trap door to figuring out this factorization. Once we know the anchor words, we can zero in on these documents where they occur. And it'll be much easier to figure out the topics from just those documents. Wait, so I, uh, just because you're in the exact case, you're assuming that every document that's about baseball has the word bunt in it. Yeah, we're going to move on later to a probabilistic one where that's not true. Okay. So can I table that, and then we'll discuss it there. But it's not that every document has bunt, but it has bunt with probability p. So no, like it has it. It has it. Oh, it has, it has it. it. So we're in the exact case right now. Okay. And later, we're going to move to a probabilistic framework, exactly p where what you're given is not the true matrix M, but samples from it, in which case words that are you know documents about a topic will not contain. So does it just 
be clear, like if, if you're thirty five percent about baseball and twenty five percent about personal finance, then you have thirty five percent whatever the P is for bunt, you have thirty five percent P exactly in that bunt category and twenty five percent. I mean, if you if, if you if you knew what the anchor words were, it would be trivial. But the the problem is that you actually don't know what these anchor words are but because you, you don't even know what the topics are. Are you also assuming that if it's not about the topic, it doesn't have the anchor word? That's what an anchor word is. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Exactly, because it's the only topic that could have generated that anchor word. So let me actually table Adam's question. That's a great question, but you're jumping a bit ahead. This will be like an extreme version of the probabilistic model where documents are really long. Okay. But when we move to when documents are short, that's exactly what makes it interesting, is that you don't need that assumption. I guess, I don't know if it's in real life makes sense, but in, I guess in principle you could also, if you don't have anchor words, maybe create anchor pairs, like yep. maybe there is not one word. Anchor phrases, is. for example. Mm -hmm. Anchor phrases. Yes. And I'm not going to get into, for example, it'll turn out that we'll be able to work with even approximate anchor words for some notion of approximation, but I don't want to get into how the error propagates and the fact that there aren't perfect anchor words, but there is some way to quantify that. And later, what I like actually about this assumption is oftentimes we're faced with this conundrum that, you know, how do you formulate good models that move beyond worst case? Well, what I like about this is that this is a type of assumption that can be falsified in a sense because I can run existing topic modeling software on real data and check are the topic matrices separable. Now, there'll be no non-zero entries in that, but they'll be close enough, it turns out, to being separable that our algorithms will work. And in fact, we'll even see this with experiments that even when we run it on real data, these algorithms will perform as well as the existing best. Okay, good. This was a slide that was supposed to get a lot of questions. So now let me tell you about the main results, which um, I'm going to present to you in this talk. In fact, all the algorithms will be really simple and very simple to understand as well. So the first algorithm is that separability really does make this problem much easier. There's a polynomial time algorithm when the topic matrix is separable. In fact, if the number of topics you're looking for is 100, say, then this is a quadratic time algorithm. And you really can run this. Okay, what's the dependence on P here? Here, there is none. Because what I'm going to get to now is a stochastic view of the problem, where then it will depend on P because you're only getting random samples from it. So it'll always be inverse poly with it. The bounds we proved don't look as good, even though they're polynomials. But in reality, when we actually test this out, it's not so bad. For regular matrix factorization, what is the complexity of the best algorithm right now? Uh, so it's, well, I mean, so computing something like SVD, you can do, uh, you know, the dimensions of the matrix times the rank. You mean NMR? Or? Yeah. It's the same thing? I was under the impression it's more like NR. I mean, if it's like a square matrix, it's closer to NR and polylog N or some such thing. I, I don't remember exactly. That's why I'm You're asking. Approximating it. Or no. Okay, I don't. Yeah. See, the thing is that for make, see, for like SVD types of things, it's tricky because there are things which are in principle constant time, but what they're doing is getting an additive approximation and Frobenius norm, and they're based on sampling from the columns according to their L2 norm. So like there are all these papers of Kanan et al. So it's very tricky to compare the different things because they depend on what oracle you're given access to, whether you're given an L2 sampling oracle for the matrix or not. But you know the best general purpose thing is roughly you know there's this Demel et al. algorithm from 2007, which is the best I know of for computing uh, SVD. That said, there are things like the Clarkson Woodruff algorithm, which are now input, you know, uh, you know, run in O tilde of the input length. For example, so they can be parameterized by the sparsity pattern of the matrix, yeah. which this is not. Right, so as I mentioned, the second half of this talk will now be a probabilistic view instead of the same type of problem, where I'm going to define this still informally because it's a lot of baggage. But what it is roughly is that documents are now generated stochastically as convex combinations of topics. Or to put it another way, you don't have exact access to the matrix M. Instead, you have access to random samples because the words you observe are samples from the underlying distribution defined by document. And you could wonder in this context whether you can still handle very incomplete data. The fact that the, term by, the word by document matrix you get is very sparse. 
So in fact, it turns out that through a clever use of this algorithm, we're going to be able to get a polynomial time algorithm for learning the parameters of any topic model, provided just that the topic matrix is separable. And I want to emphasize that what I particularly like about this theorem is that it'll really work for a broad range of topic models. In fact, topic modeling is a gigantic literature within machine learning, where they you know, keep uh, proposing progressively more and more complex models that are closer to reality. You know, LDA is sort of the beginning of these things. And what I like is that this algorithm actually works with any of those. So it works for, you know, in a fairly oblivious way to how you're generating the documents as convex combinations of topics. So maybe that's what eventually makes this algorithm actually practical, is that it turns out that when we implemented this algorithm, it runs 50 to 100 times faster than the existing best algorithms out there. Things like the Mallet Toolkit, with nearly identical performance on every metric we tried. Everything from L1 to log likelihood to things like coherence. Are there any questions? And I want to mention that uh, there's actually been a lot of beautiful work on topic modeling over the last year. So Shams in the audience and uh, a lot of people in Microsoft have been doing great things where Daniel. they give, and Daniel, and give great algorithms for LDA, which are based on entirely different techniques or based on tensor methods instead. So these techniques are very different and the guarantees are sort of incomparable. So I, uh, it's a little bit too much of a tangent to talk about it right now and I'll talk about it towards the end. Uh, or maybe we can get Sham to. Just to make sure I understand what is this uh, the stochastic generation process. So if you, you have, uh, I mean, once you pick the collection of topics that a document is supposed to be about, you get a distribution. If the distribution puts zero probability on a word, you will not see that word, right? Yep. Okay, so, so it's not possible for some erroneous, erroneous words to appear. No, okay. no. But the problem is that now what you observe, when documents are short, when they're only 100 words long, and your vocabulary is, you know, 30,000. You have a very sparse matrix, which the true matrix M is very dense, potentially. So can you even handle this level of uncertainty? But we're getting ahead of ourselves because I'm going to formally define this later. And I want to focus on first this algorithm right here. This is very simple, the first one. OK, so I guess um, let me move on to telling you. I've, I've told you this algorithm is simple. Let me show you how simple. So I guess maybe the first question I should address is how do anchor words help? So here I'm making the assertion that once you assume there are these anchor words out there, that the problem becomes much easier, not exponential on the topics, but quadratic time. So how do anchor words help? And actually, <clears throat> so I want to emphasize this, since this is important even though I've already said it, we don't know the anchor words. Even though this matrix is separable, we don't know these green squares. Yet the fact that we're multiplying this matrix A by W what it means is when you take an anchor word, say the second row of A, it picks out the second row of W, scales it, puts it in M. So this is what makes the problem much easier is that part of our factorization is hiding in plain sight. The matrix W It's part of our input. We just need to figure out which rows correspond to W. We just need to identify the anchor words. So how can we identify the anchor words? Maybe if, you are, if you're assuming one anchor word, you might as well assume two or three, right? Uh, per topic? Yes. You could do that. So yep. you'll actually see repetitions. So you, you'll actually see repetitions in, the, in this matrix, like a whole row. You could. Matrix. Yeah, you could. In fact, um, again, let me table that. You know, because when I go to this topic modeling, this probabilistic interpretation, we'll see a good way to use even non-anchor words and learn something about the topic matrix. So. That's sort of a generalization of your question, is how can you even use productively words that are close to anchor words? So how can we find these anchor words? So what we want right now is an algorithm, when I give you a row, to tell me, is it an anchor row? And now this will actually just come from a very simple geometric picture that I'll use not only here but throughout this talk. So consider a row that's not an anchor row. So take the first row in this matrix A. It's not an anchor row. And when we multiply it by the matrix W, we pick out the first and third rows of W and add them together. And we get this first row in M. So what this means is that when you're not an anchor row, you can be expressed as a convex combination of the anchor rows if you do the normalization right. <coughs> so it's a very simple geometric picture now. What are anchor words? They're the vertices of a simplex. 
they're extreme points that once we figure them out, we can express everything else as a convex combination. So now the algorithm is very simple. Let's get a geometric condition, which helps us identify whether a word is an anchor word or not. Well, what happens when I delete a row from M and it is an anchor word? <coughs> then the convex hull strictly changes. Because we've deleted a vertex. Uh -huh. These are points uh, in how many dimensions? These are, so, right, so I'm taking the rows in M and plotting them. I see. Okay. And I'm normalizing them so that they sum to 1. Okay. I'll have to sort of do some funny business with normalization throughout this talk, but you can just ignore it if you want. Um, that's to make sure it's a convex combination and not a non-negative combination. <coughs> <coughs> right, so, I mean, once I delete an anchor row, I've changed the convex hull because I've deleted one of the vertices of the simplex. And yet, in comparison, when I delete a non-anchor row, the convex hull doesn't change. So deleting a word changes the convex hull if and only if it's an anchor word. And now there's actually a very simple algorithm. We can, for simplicity, do this with linear programming, although there are much more clever and faster ways to do this. Well, when we want to determine whether a row is an anchor row, we delete it and we check, can we express it as a convex combination of the remaining rows? If we can, then the convex hull hasn't changed and it's not an anchor row. If we can't, then the convex hull has changed and it is one. So now I can tell you the full algorithm. I mean, I've already analyzed it for you. We find the anchor rows. Let's say by linear programming. Let me come back to this in a second. Then we paste these rows in M. We paste them into W. We know one of the factors. And now we only have one missing factor, and it's a convex optimization problem. So we just need to find the non-negative A so that A times W is as close as possible to M. So this is the algorithm. In fact, how fast is this algorithm? So let's do things a little bit more cleverly here. So what I'm really trying to do with this anchor word step is I'm trying to find the vertices of a simplex. Yet I can do this without linear programming. Imagine I found one of the vertices. Now I can greedily look for the point that's furthest away from that. That will be a vertex of the simplex. Then I can greedily find the point that's furthest away from those two. That'll be another vertex in the simplex. And I'll greedily find the one that's furthest away from that. So in this way, we can greedily, in a very combinatorially way, find these anchor words in quadratic time. In fact, you can even analyze how the error accumulates in these types of procedures. Like, if you're not really given a simplex, you can bound how the error accumulates in the words that you find. Sorry, I know you answered that. Yes. So you're, you're in the number of dimensions is the number of words or the number of documents? The number of documents, because we're taking rows and m. And even this last step. Is there a way to make this first step parallel? Probably. I mean, you have to make sure that when you parallelize it, you're not finding the same anchor word over and over again. But what you could do is for a well conditioned simplex, you can just try and find one of the vertices many times in parallel. And just by, like, uh, you know, I mean, you just merge the lists and you'll find all of them even if you find it repeated many times. So there, there is a way to parallelize it. Uh, I mean, it won't get as good error bounds in terms of how the error accumulates, but it'll still be parallelizable in this way. So in fact, now what I want to do is I want to take a probabilistic view. So this is something I've been sort of hinting at. But now I want to understand whether this algorithm can be made to work with very incomplete data. So when we're not given access to the matrix M, but we're given access to random samples from it. And now I can finally formally introduce this topic model, although Madhu sort of already defined it. Um, so it's very similar to non-negative matrix factorization. We have a fixed set of topics. But now there'll be two crucial differences. Uh, the first difference is that this matrix W that encodes representations of documents as convex combinations of topics, this matrix will be stochastically generated. So there's some distribution that generates the columns of W. So for example, maybe when I sample from this distribution, the first document is entirely about personal finance. And then I get this column in M. And the second document is half about baseball and half about movie reviews. And I get the second column of M. That's the first difference, is W is stochastic. Now the second difference is the one that's crucial. This document is defined by a distribution on words. It, it equivalently is one but I'm not given access to that distribution because the document is not very long. Instead, what I'm given access to are random samples from it. 
So for example, if these documents are only two words long, I might just see these blue boxes instead. It was, you look kind of abstract away and you assume that these are independent samples. Yeah, that's right. That everyone does. <laughs> so, right, so I want to emphasize that here the challenge is that this word by document matrix that I observe is very sparse. You know, if, if documents are only like 100 words long, like in abstracts, and this is like 15,000, this is a very sparse matrix, and you know, compared to the true matrix M, and yet I still want to be able to recover the number of, you know, the topics correctly. The thing I have freedom to play with is that I can potentially take more documents. The question is, how many documents do you need to be able to actually figure out the topics? Sorry, this is like the sort of title. Feel free to refer, but um, like roughly for like lists of documents, like what are the what's the actual rank and what's the actual like non-negative rank of like I don't know Wikipedia or New York Times or something? Not Wikipedia. <coughs> <laughs> but no, like New York, like roughly what? Well, I mean, I think you should ask how the approximate rank and how the approximate yeah, yeah, yeah. non-negative sure, rank. Yeah, sure, whatever, 90, I, I, I mean, yeah. Uh, I mean, they, they both actually seem to decay at not such different rates, but they don't have any sort of sharp threshold where beyond that, you know, there's some like drop off. So it really is this game where you have a little bit of freedom to choose how many topics. But then, you know, I mean, they will produce good topics, actually. I mean, it's, it's sort of this trade-off that as you increase the number of topics, sometimes you have a topic that fractures into a few different topics, for example. So it's sort of... Um, it's not that the non-negative rank is uh, dramatically higher than the rank. It's just that you get better results if you insist on non-negative. Yeah, that's right. You get, much, you get topics which are much easier to interpret, for starters. So the issue is that, you know, when this thing is allowed to be orthogonal, then when you're projecting onto the space, documents are, are, uh, are said to be more similar even based on words they both omit because this has negative entries. So that's sort of the intuition for where this came from. And there's, there's a long history that probably starts with Hoffman and probabilistic latent semantic indexing. I see, but in practice you don't see that big of a gap between how well you can, you can uh, generate I mean, you see a fairly constant gap in you know, how, I mean, they don't behave differently qualitatively in their asymptotics. But uh, you know, the quality of the topics looks much better. OK, so just to refocus now, actually, this is a very general problem I've described. In fact, there's a, long, there's a very large literature on topic modeling where there are just different ways to generate the columns of W. <coughs> so for example, there's this very popular model called latent Dirichlet allocation of Bly, Ning, and Jordan. That's just a particular way to generate the columns of W using a Dirichlet distribution. And this is some distribution that favors relatively sparse combinations of topics. But of course, there are even more complex topic models, things, refinements on top of this, like the correlated topic model of Bly and Lafferty, which then allows certain types of structured correlations and anti-correlations between topics. And this, the columns of W are generated by a logistic normal. And there are even fancier ones, like the Pachinko allocation model, where these columns are generated by some multi-level directed acyclic graph that sort of intuitively tries to capture a topic hierarchy. Yet my point here is not to emphasize that these, you know, I don't want to dwell on these differences between these models, but my main point is that even the differences between these models can be thought of all in the same framework as just being differences in how W is generated. In fact, in light of this, I want to make the case that you know, what we should strive for algorithms that work for broad families of topic models so that their analysis of these algorithms rests on fairly general principles and is not tailor-made to some of the details of the model. So that way, even if you think the world is generated according to LDA, you'll have an algorithm with guarantees. Or even if you dream up some much more complex model, you'll still have something you can say algorithmically. So this is, yep. I'm a little confused. I thought the documents might, uh, so you get a sample of words. Let's say it's a single topic document. You'll get a sample of <coughs> words associated with that topic. So how is this the same as saying W is generated? Because then your topic distribution is like fixed, right? So. Uh, no, these are two different, these are two different changes to the NMF model. Oh, okay. See, for example, you need W to be stochastically generated in, in some way. So that you know you don't just end up with like purely 
you know, on a single topic or something like that. I mean, it's, it's just an extra modeling feature. That, see, the thing is that what you learn is the topics, you might never be able to figure out what topics describe a document all that well, sure. right? Because if there are only two words that you get per document, even if you knew what you're looking for, the topic matrix, you still have some inherent uncertainty on what the topics are that describe it. Sure. So the point is that you know, you're not trying to get every document perfectly right, because even the model can't figure it out, but you're still trying to learn the topics. Sure. That's sort of the crucial uh, part. Right, so now this last part of this talk is now focusing on this question really at an abstract level of what if the documents are short? Can we still learn the topic matrix, even though what we're given is very sparse? And actually, this algorithm will be equally simple to understand and analyze. And the crucial observation is that maybe the term by document, or the word by document matrix is the wrong matrix to work with. Let's instead work with something called the Gram matrix, which is just the word by document matrix times its own transpose. <coughs> So, you know, so this is a word by word matrix. Oh, I see. And it measures the co occurrence of different pairs of words. But, you know, the first reason to even consider this matrix is that now as we increase the number of documents, the dimensions of this matrix are not growing. Unlike the word by document matrix, which keeps growing out, this converges to something. Right? So it converges to its own expectation, which I can now pull out these topic matrices. And inside, I have the stochastic matrix W. W times W transpose also converges to something. This is a measure of the different pairs of topics, how often they co-occur. And so now, the entire point of this picture is just that these are three non-negative matrices. So I can group together these last two. It's a non-negative matrix. And this is separable. So we're again in separable NMF. Now, there, there's a slight twist here, which is that this matrix, the normalization, is not what it was in the original NMF problem. So it turns out what we'll actually be able to get is just the anchor words from this. They'll be extreme rows of the Gram matrix. What do you mean by extreme rows? Well, you take m hat, m hat transpose, and you look at the rows. And you normalize them so if they sum to 1, they'll be vertices of a simplex. So, so they'll be so extreme points. extreme rows, you mean the extreme? Right. Yeah. the extreme points of the right. corresponding symbol. We'll still have to do just a slight more yeah. bit of work to find the rest of the topic matrix, which I'm now going to describe. Yeah. But the point is that given enough documents, we can still find the anchor words in these models. And now the real question, the last technical part is, how can we use these anchor words to find the rest of the topic matrix? And this will actually come from first a reinterpretation of what it means for a word to be an anchor word. So for example, if a word occurs in a document and I know nothing else about that document, I have some posterior distribution on what topic generated it. In fact, a word is an anchor word if and only if this posterior distribution is supported on one topic. Mm -hmm. That's the definition of an anchor word, is that when the word occurs, you know what topic generated it. And now the key point is that once we have the anchor words, we'll be able to use them to find the other posterior distributions for all of the other words. And this will come back to this geometric picture now, right? I have these rows of m hat, m hat transpose, which the anchor words are these extreme points. And now if I take a non-anchor word, word number three, I can express it as a convex combination of the anchor words. It's half anchor word two and half anchor word three. But what does this mean? It means we're taking the co-occurrence of word number three with all the other words. And that's the vector in m hat, m hat transpose. And we're expressing that vector as a convex combination of the co-occurrence of anchor word two with the other words and of anchor word three with the other words. So if you work it out, what this means is I can express the posterior distribution on topics for this word as this convex combination of posterior distributions on topics for these anchor words. So we actually know the posterior distribution on topics for anchor word three. It's the same convex combination because anchor words have a very simple posterior. So the posterior distribution for word number three is half topic two and half topic three. And we get this from just this geometric viewpoint of what's going on. So now what we have is we have probability of topic given word. And yet what we really want, the entries in this matrix are probability of word given topic. So all we have to do is use Bayes' rule to switch which one is which. Or to put it another way, it's this formula. And the key point is that everything on the right-hand side we know. We know either we know probability of topic given word from the geometric picture, 
And we know the probability of the different words just by looking at our data. So we actually can use this formula then to go to what we want. And that's the algorithm. So we form the gram matrix to find the anchor words. They're extreme points again, but now of the gram matrix. And we can use a combinatorial algorithm to find them. And then we write each word as a convex combination of anchor words. This gives us these posterior distributions. And now from these posterior distributions for each word, we can compute A using this formula. Sorry, this is in the stochastic case, right? Yep. So, those, so it's not exactly a... Right, but you can bound the error accumulation in this. Okay. And then it'll give you effective bounds on how many documents you need to get a certain <coughs> amount of accuracy. And this will then depend on things like the piece separability. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's intuitively very similar, yes. And this, you know, now, you know, how the error, you know, how many documents you need will play a role in what error you have for each of these steps, and then there'll be some compounding of the error that you can then analyze. But there is a provable bound for this. And in fact, this algorithm now works without any assumptions on how this stochastic matrix is generated, other than this matrix R needs to be non-singular. So there has to be no topic which is exactly some linear combination of other topics in how often it co-occurs. And this works whether you think the world is LDA, correlated topic model, or Pachinko allocation model, or even more complex things you can dream up, provided just that the topic matrix is separable. And actually, I want to tell you something interesting about this algorithm, that it was actually inspired by experiments, which is somewhat unique. What I mean by that is we had an initial algorithm with provable guarantees that was based on the same pattern. First find the anchor words, then find the rest of the topic matrix. But it used matrix inversion. And that's an inherently noisy step, which then actually produced many small not, you know, negative values in the topic matrix you know, for small number of top, for documents. Yet what we're looking for is a distribution. So this was the impetus to actually look for something that used the fact that what it was looking for was a distribution. That's what led to a way to get around matrix inversion based on Bayes' rule instead. So this is, I think, somewhat unique that both of these algorithms have provable guarantees. And yet, as we'll see in the real data, this is the crucial difference that made this algorithm from useless to very practical, is that it started to use Bayes' rule. So let me tell you about actually experiments. And this is the first time I've described experiments in a talk. But uh, I assure you I didn't code it. Uh, so you know, how can you go about testing these algorithms now? We have provable guarantees for them. So we know that given enough documents, a polynomial number of them in the parameters we're looking for, that we do get the you know, true topics. But we want to test how fast they really work. How many is that number of documents huge or is it tiny for this algorithm to do well? So in fact, you want to test these algorithms in a setting where you know they provably work, and you're going to test how fast they really do work. And so one way to do this, which is actually novel to this paper, is learning a topic matrix on real data using other existing software. So you can take like New York Times articles and fit a topic model to it. You can take NIPS articles and fit a topic model to it, or clinical data and fit a topic model to it. And then you use that topic model to generate further data. This way you're assured that you know, the matrix that you're trying to learn is somewhat realistic. And we found that our algorithm is 50 to 100 times faster. And let's check the performance on other data. But I want to emphasize that it's actually not surprising that it's faster because the existing approaches out there use things like you know, MCMC methods. And this is entirely based on simple linear algebraic steps. So this should, of course, be fast. So People who actually do this use MCMC methods. Yeah, Gibbs sampling. Yep. Yeah. This mallet toolkit that's very popular from UMass Amherst. In fact, we um, we wrote a paper with someone who helped write mallet. So David Mimno wrote mallet. Uh, no, no. Yeah. So it was um, someone at UMass Amherst, and Mimno contributed a lot to it. But um, so the timing results are not <laughs> so interesting because the algorithm is fast. Uh, so this is this recover algorithm based on matrix inversion. And this is the one I described. Recover L2 is the one that at its heart is using Bayes' rule. And so it's very fast compared to Gibbs sampling. Yet what I found surprising was how accurate it is. So this is measuring the L1 distance, you know, the error between the topic matrix we found to the truth. 
because we are generating the documents from some truth. And in fact, as you see, this recover algorithm is pretty terrible. This is the one based on matrix inversion. It's not much better than random guessing. It's L1 distances above one for you know, quite some time, right? And yet, look at recover L2 now. This is this, uh, this color right here. And actually, not only does it get pretty quickly to the same this level as M Gibbs. M times M transpose. Right? This, we do it either way, but this is the one based on Bayes rule instead Bayes of time. matrix inversion. Right, okay. And it actually gets better than Gibbs eventually. So it's faster and better according to this metric. And this is also true for log likelihood. Again, recover is terrible, and recover L2 is, is very comparable, despite being much faster. Yep? Using your uh, separability condition, can you show whether the other algorithms that are out there are provably correct or not for separable I, uh, I would be shocked if they are. But uh, thank you for bringing that up. I almost forgot to mention. So what's remarkable about this is that these topic matrices are not separable. I've just learned them on data. I haven't enforced that they're separable, and yet these algorithms still work. Does it mean that they're probably uh, are they separable? nearly separable? They're, they're or nearly that? separable. Okay. They're nearly separable. But, you know, I mean, it's actually hard to say, you know, how, how well we can prove bounds for how close they need to be to nearly separable for our algorithm to work is much more pessimistic than apparently they need to be. So geometrically, the separability said that you have n points and n dimensions, but the, the contain a convex hull of R of these. And when you say these are nearly separable, what does this condition translate to? So, so uh, um, you're almost right. I mean, you're probably right, but let me check on this. So even though there's a convex hull of R points, that's actually the general NMF problem. The difference is that part of your, you know, in NMF, what makes it hard is that you don't know the vertices that simplex. These are the topics. Yet, what makes this much easier is that these vertices are sort of present in the data already. So when you plot your data, not only is it contained in a you know, convex hull of R points, but these R points are either present in the data or nearly present in the data. Right. So that's what the notion of near anchor words is, is that they're nearly present. Because that's actually, I mean, that's a very good intuition for what makes NMF so hard in the worst case, is that you don't know where these missing R points are that magically contain all of the data. Or how quickly can you? Very, OK. okay. Yep. OK, so we ran this on real data. And in fact, you can run on 300,000 New York Times articles in 10 minutes instead of 20 hours. And now I can tell you that, um, let me just say where this fits into a broader agenda. So I think a lot of my working learning can be thought of as being organized around this question as learning computationally easy. So when we abstract out these hard optimization problems from learning applications, are they really a barrier to further progress in learning? One direction to attack this question is new models. This is what I described in this talk, is this notion of separability then leads to theoretical questions about can you design good NMF algorithms under it and topic models. And we use tools from computational geometry and actually, an important piece of the picture is experiments here, is the way that experiments can help corroborate these new models and you know, also be able to test out these algorithms. It helps you figure out whether your new model is worth anything. Yet another direction for attacking this question is oftentimes these computationally hard problems come from choosing the wrong estimator. So when you use maximum likelihood, you invariably encounter hard optimization problems. Another direction, which you can organize some of my work on, is in finding new estimators that avoid maximum likelihood. So like in joint work with uh, Greg and Adam, we used method of moments to learn mixtures of Gaussians. I guess since we're running short on time, I'll just mention that um, we gave a first polynomial time algorithm to learn the parameters of any constant number of mixtures of Gaussians. And we've also been working on questions like, can we make these estimators robust? So maximum likelihood is something that inherently is very robust to model misspecification. So something we shouldn't lose sight of when we're trying to find surrogates for max likelihood is to make sure that these algorithms are not you know, robust, you know, uh, hopelessly not robust outliers. So I've been trying to understand um, you know, what the interplay is between robustness and efficiency. And I can tell you maybe about some of my work on uh, doing this for robust linear regression. With Moritz Hart, we resolved what the right uh, trade-off is between robustness and efficiency. And I've also done some work on population recovery and deep learning that 
I'll be happy to tell you guys about. And I guess the last um, thing is that I guess there's just one piece of what I work on. I work on algorithms more generally. So my thesis work was actually on approximation algorithms and metric embeddings. It was about taking a very large graph and finding smaller representations for its communication structure. This is something that uses a lot of tools from, say, discrete geometry. Lately, I've been thinking about some uses of information theory to lower bound linear programs to show that linear programs can't you know, be small and solve clique, for example. That's joint work with Mark Braverman. And I've also done some work on combinatorics and things like smooth analysis. Like um, this past year, I had a paper with Noga and Benny where we showed the first dense graphs that have large induced matchings. And that's it. So I'll summarize that often these optimization problems that we abstract from learning applications are intractable like they were for NMF and for things like mixtures of Gaussians? Are there new models that better capture the instances we really want to solve? These new models then lead to interesting theoretical questions, which in fact can lead to highly practical new algorithms. And this is really just the beginning. I think there's been a lot of exciting work in these areas. Uh, also mention uh, Sham and Daniel's work again as being some of the other people who have been working a lot in this area, and Greg as well. And that's it.